Some of you may be wondering about the title of this sermon, Fun with Venn Diagrams. <laughs> Apparently God was wondering too, because last night at a social reception, I was asked to explain. We were talking to a couple from another part of the state when the subject came up. They're about the age of our next generation in our family. His family is from Nigeria, hers from Korea. And when we apolog apologized that we had to leave early because I was preaching in the morning, naturally they wanted to know what I was talking about. Now, God has been helping me through this message for a couple of months, whispering here, revising there, cutting a lot, but he never gave me a three minute elevator speech to explain what it was all about. So I flailed for a bit. It's, not about, it, it's about not drawing circles around people, putting them bo in boxes, I said, mixing my metaphors. Oh, it's about prejudice, our companion said. And I agreed. Then he asked if I'd ever preached before. And I said, yes, I had. About 10 years ago, I told the story of the Hackensack Congregational Church, which my family belonged to when I was a child. But it moved to a new building farther uptown, and it couldn't sustain itself. It disbanded, and now it's a Korean church. And so we chatted a little bit about Christianity and Korean communities and Katrina's mission trip with our students and fitting into a community of faith. After that exchange, God nudged me again about the elevator speech. So today's talk isn't about prejudice, so much it is as it is about recognizing the things we have in common with other people. Today's scripture lessons speak to that division and factionalism of our times. You can really hear it in this Good News translation. You're probably more familiar with that first reading. Abraham Lincoln quoted it from another translation in a famous speech. A house divided against itself cannot stand. In the second reading, the churches in Galatia were squabbling. Do the descendants of Abraham receive salvation through following Jesus, Jew, Jewish law, as some had been preaching, or is it available through faith in Jesus? It was an important issue for the early church, but it was tearing that community apart. Paul even starts that chapter by asking, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched you? We can ask the same of ourselves on many issues of today. Who has bewitched us? Young or old, male or female, red or blue, pro or anti, black or white. Anytime you have two sides, us and them, you have the risk that a healthy debate will turn into an endless struggle. In her 2021 book, High Conflict, How We Get Trapped and How We Get Out, Amanda Ripley names four fire starters that can bewitch us. Group identities, conflict entrepreneurs who can stand to benefit from a fight, embarrassment or humiliation, and corruption. It sounds like the churches at Galatia had at least three of those. Group identities, Jews, and non-Jews. Conflict entrepreneurs, preachers who said that only those who follow the law of their Jewish ancestors can inherit the kingdom of God. Humiliation or embarrassment, families who had followed that law for generations were now being told it isn't the path to salvation. Paul comes down on the side of faith over law, but to do so he does look at the big, at the big picture. Forget the differences that drive us apart and instead concentrate on what we have in common. We are all children of God and that is what brings us salvation. Conflict isn't always bad. Any writer will tell you that in order to have a story, you need characters and some kind of conflict that needs to be resolved. Both of our lessons today come from similar conflicts. Teachers of the law against the man of faith. We wouldn't have those lessons if they didn't have to resolve those differences. But what happens when group identities are unclear? About a month ago, Barbara and I were at my college reunion and we started chatting with a classmate I'd never met. He wondered how that could have happened on our cozy campus. I told him that in my college days, I traveled in a few small circles, the campus newspaper, the radio station, and my co-ed fraternity. He agreed about the limits of circles. His own was the swimming team. He was a swimmer. They know all about going in circles, and they stay in their own lanes. <laughs> then he said, 
I didn't know that fraternity admitted men. The co-ed fraternity does require some explanation. Our local house split with its national in the 1950s over policy that excluded Jewish members. Later, we were the first to admit black members and one of two to admit women when the college went co-ed in the 1970s. We adopted the motto, unity in diversity. So you can understand his confusion. He wasn't part of the circle. Misunderstandings arrive when people draw circles to set themselves apart from others or allow others to draw the circles around them. In reality, we are, we are not separate. We're all in this together. We are part of the same team. As a church, that means the body of Christ. As a nation, we're all Americans. As a world, we are some eight billion souls. The world would be a much better place if we spent less time looking at what makes us different and more time looking at what we have in common. And one thing we have in common is we're all different. God made each of us unique. We are minorities of one. Let me explain by giving myself as an example. Let's admit it. If, you're on the, if I'm on the inside of a circle and you're on the outside, we probably both feel a little tension just because of that. We're different. But no one has just one identity circle drawn around them. We live in, or even two. We live in a world of Venn diagrams. You remember those things from school? You draw a circle that defines, that represents a set, a group with similar circumstances, characteristics. Then you overlap it with another circle that showing another group with different characteristics. If you look at me, you will see that I am an old man. So, the Venn diagram of an old man looks something like this. Old man. The orange represents the old, and the blue circle represents the man. The small area where the two circles overlap, where I'm standing right now, are the subset that has both characteristics, old man. Now, let's go binary. What is the opposite of an old man? This is where I need some help. I've recruited some young women from the Tiso family. Now, while they come up here, let me call your attention to the Venn diagrams in today's insert. It shows early Beach Boys songs that mention cars, girls, and surf. But it doesn't show all the Beach Boys songs. If you're looking for God Only Knows, or that's why God made the radio, you won't find those. Venn diagrams only, don't only show, only, only show the members of one group, just the ones inside the circle. So, please put on your, your hula hoops and start having fun. Although this old man will fit in these identity hoops, he's not the only one of his kind in the church. Whoa, they are good. <laughs> So while the two young women might be enjoying their hoops or getting tangled up in them or what have you, the third one will stand outside and wonder what on earth is going on. <laughs> Stephanie also happens to be a deacon, so she represents the church as a whole. The green hoop represents young, and the pink one represents women. You'll see that none, neither of the hoops defining this old man have any overlap with the young women there. What's more, the old man, who has been the center of attention so far, is getting upstaged. That's inevitable, but it can be embarrassing, and that's one of the ways conflict gets started. So are these two identity groups doomed to the tension of living in separate circles forever? How do we resolve this? In her book, Ripley tells stories about individuals getting it out of high conflict situations, gang warfare, eco-terrorism, political vendettas. They reach a saturation point and cultivate a new group identity that is part of a larger whole. So in order for this old man and these 
young women, to find common ground, we have to disentangle ourselves from, from the circles that we're tied up in and see ourselves as part of a larger, greater group, a greater group, the church. So I'll go first and hand my hope, hoops over to our deacon. And then we'll ask the two young women to do the same. And then we'll all have these hoops to play with during the, uh, the lemonade social hour downstairs. Afterwards, uh, they are, these same young ladies are inviting you to, worship, to refreshments this, uh, today after worship, so enjoy. Thank you, ladies. The other Venn diagram The other Venn diagram in your, in your insert shows the, is from Steve Miller's song, The Joker. In that one, you'll see that the more labels you add, the more specific you can get where they overlap. You can start naming names. Steve Miller is right in the center of that one. He may not be the only person in the world who is a joker, a smoker, a midnight toker, a picker, a grinner, a lover, and a sinner. But he's the only one who made a song out of it and hit the charts. <laughs> that makes him a minority of one. When you draw enough circles, every one of us is a minority of one. Even when I was on campus and inside the circles of the newspaper, the radio station, and the fraternity, I wasn't the only member of that subset. There were others. But I, too, am a minority of one. I was the president of our house during an incident of hate speech that tested our motto of unity and diversity. Everyone passionately took sides. Some agreed with the speaker. Some thought he was being satirical. Some disagreed, but said he had the right to say, say what he thought. Others were so offended that they called for his immediate expulsion. Still others threatened to quit the house. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And my fraternity was a house divided. Yet that house still stands today. That's because, and this is 50 years later, that's because we appealed to all the members as part of something bigger. By seeing ourselves as, part, as equal parts of the whole, we were able to keep things together. When a similar situation came up in a different organization decades later, the leaders worked to resolve it the same way. It was a rocky time, but we did it together. That house still stands, too. In the coming months, as our nation enters into another divisive political season and our church begins its open and affirming discussions, remember today's lesson and the Venn diagrams. Everyone is a minority, if only a minority of one. And despite the circles we draw around ourselves and others, we are all part of the same big picture. Be proud of it and do your best to preserve it. Oh, and about that big picture, you'll hear more about that this fall, so during our stewardship campaign, so stay tuned. Let me end with Edwin Markham's poem, Outwitted. He drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and drew him in. Amen.